Genesis chapter 41, verse 1 through 40. A dreamer who interprets dreams. Lesson 6 in the story of Joseph. Forsaken by his brothers and sold into slavery, falsely accused by his master's wife and thrown into prison, forgotten by a friend whose freedom he foretold and left for dead, Joseph keeps going down. But once again, he will rise. The Christian story follows what Paul Miller calls a J-curve, a dip followed by a sudden and unexpected rise. Glory eventually follows suffering, and resurrection can only come after crucifixion. Before we dive into the details of Genesis 41, keep in mind that just as Pharaoh experiences in this scene, Joseph had two dreams at the beginning of his story that were one and the same. Today, Joseph will go through his final phase of transformation on the way to becoming who God called him to be in the dreams he gave him. As he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, his own dreams are going to come true. The narrator begins, as he's prone to do, with a time marker. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Two years, 730 days, 17,520 hours of isolation, loneliness, paralyzing fear. Remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Joseph had relayed this desperate request to the cupbearer after he prophesied his freedom. His interpretation of a dream the cupbearer had the night before. Remember me, he calls. But the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Do you ever feel forgotten? Do you ever feel forsaken, ever feel afraid? You're actually in pretty good company. These feel like markers of shame, but they can actually be badges of honor. It all depends on what kingdom you're living in. Pharaoh has two dreams, but in verse 25, Joseph declares the dreams are one and the same. And it's this interpretive key that the magicians and the wise men missed But Pharaoh understood. In verse 15, he says, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, singular, you can interpret it. Again, singular. One dream, two versions. Version 1 begins in verse 17. In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. When out of the river, there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first, but even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. Then version 2 begins in verse 22. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. Bruce Waltke offers a concise summary. In both dreams, the fat is devoured by the lean. But at this point, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves as there are three important things that happened to Joseph before Pharaoh shares the details of his dreams. First, keep in mind this happens on the day the cupbearer remembers him. In verse 9 we read, The cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. That Hebrew word for shortcomings was translated offended. Back at the beginning of chapter 40, where the text reads, Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master. Joseph's insight into these two men's dreams, which were not one and the same, rather completely opposite, revealed that the cupbearer was innocent and the baker was guilty. The baker had committed a sin of commission. He sinned against the king, precisely how we don't know. The cupbearer was first pronounced innocent, but he's no longer innocent. He has committed a sin of omission. He has sinned against Joseph by failing to remember him. Second, don't forget this happens on the day that Joseph would have felt like it was just any other day, just another sad, miserable, lonely day in prison. 
till suddenly he summoned and brought to Pharaoh. In verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When a sovereign storyteller is writing your story, surprises await you around every corner, but you can never predict them, and you can rarely be prepared for them. Third, Joseph is given a change of clothes, and clothes are always significant in his story. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Earlier, it had been his robe, symbolizing his father's favor, which his brothers stripped from him. Then it was his cloak, which Potiphar's wife used to falsely accuse him. His robe resulted in one dungeon, his cloak another, but here a reversal happens. His clothes aren't stripped or left behind. Instead, he gets a brand new pair of clothes. This providential wardrobe change from prison jumpsuit to garments fit to be worn in the presence of a king symbolize a drastic shift. Not only in Joseph's social status, but his entire story. The narrator is signaling us that everything in Joseph's life is about to be radically transformed. Joseph becomes the only way Pharaoh can understand his dreams, while Pharaoh becomes the only way that Joseph's dreams can come true. That's why it's so shocking that right after he's summoned, cleanly shaven, and given new clothes, the first words out of his mouth are, I cannot do it. Joseph, don't tell him that. What are you thinking? You can almost hear Eminem in the background. Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip? Joseph, don't let this slip. I can't do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Literally, this reads, God will answer the peace of Pharaoh, meaning God will give Pharaoh an interpretation that brings him peace. Back in Genesis 38, Tamar took a massive risk, a risk that righteousness required. Here, Joseph is about to take the same kind of risk. The first risk he takes is to promise Pharaoh peace before he even hears the dream. This is especially remarkable because Joseph has already demonstrated the ability to distinguish between good news and bad news when he interprets dreams. Just ask the cupbearer and the baker. But even more, he has also demonstrated the courage to share the bad news if that's what God reveals to him. In a strange way, then, Joseph's character and his gifts come together to put his own neck on the line before he even hears the details of the dream. The second risk he takes, though, is even bigger. It occurs after he interprets Pharaoh's dream. But first, we need to look at the interpretation, which begins in verse 25, where Joseph says God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. In ancient Near Eastern culture, dreams were viewed as a special bond between God and king, the assumption being that kings who dreamed dreams were receiving a glimpse into something God planned to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. Joseph then pauses right in the middle of his interpretation to remind Pharaoh how he knows what he knows. It's just as I said, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Then he continues, Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The reason the dream was given Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. In other words, each dream bears witness to the other. Together, they confirm Joseph's interpretation. Incidentally, have you noticed how the narrator uses God's divine name, Yahweh, Lord in all caps, to describe Joseph's relationship with God? This is much earlier in his story, but 
Now, when Joseph speaks to pagans like Potiphar's wife, or the cupbearer and the baker, and now Pharaoh, he uses the more general and universal Elohim, God with just one cap. Why? I think it's a beautiful picture of how accommodating God is to those who don't know him. Joseph wants Pharaoh to recognize the God he is speaking about, and since God himself engages in such a drastic level of accommodation to people who do not know him, precisely so that they can know him, surely we, his people today, are not only free to do this, but should even be encouraged to do this. Moving forward, by actually going backward, Recall that in the scene prior, Joseph's interpretation of another pair of dreams meant good news for the cupbearer, but bad news for the baker. Here, similarly, Joseph has good news and bad news again, but this time both are for Pharaoh. Seven years of famine, the bad news, will follow seven years of abundance, the good news. And Joseph could have just left it at that, meaning put the ball in Pharaoh's court Let him respond however he wants to, but Joseph does not do that. Instead, he takes another risk, and this one is more massive than the first. Joseph looks a king square in the face and tells him what to do. He gives Pharaoh unsolicited advice, but he does so humbly carefully appealing to his authority, wisely not volunteering himself, ultimately resting in God's sovereignty. In the process, we also learn that sometimes prophecies are set in stone. Again, just ask the cupbearer and the baker. But on other occasions, there's room to respond. There's flexibility, freedom to act, the opportunity to make a plan, which is exactly what Joseph does. Let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. It's so ironic. The person most qualified for the position is the very same person making the recommendation. And this phrase, put him in charge, has been used throughout Joseph's story. He was put in charge of Potiphar's house. He was put in charge of the king's prison. Now he encourages Pharaoh to put someone else in charge. But he also doesn't beg to be the one in charge. He doesn't say, pick me, pick me. But it's still a huge risk. He takes it in an extremely calculated way. God calls us to take risks. What are the risks he's calling you to take? And how do you know? And will you take them? Joseph's story is helpful as you process questions like these. Joseph takes risks, but he also waits. He puts his trust unswervingly in God, but he also speaks up for himself when given the opportunity. He passively rests in God's presence, his provision, his power, But he also actively engages. He interprets dreams. He asks others to help him. He boldly tells a king what to do. In his commentary on this scene, Bruce Waltke wisely notes that God's sovereignty lays the foundation for human activity. Another irony. Since God controls everything, we're free to risk anything, provided it's a risk rooted in righteousness. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. His plan has three simple steps. First, appoint what was known back then as a vizier, a prime minister, a second chair. Who will, second, appoint local overseers to carry out the plan, which is third, a rationing system that will save people from the famine, the bad news, by using the resources of the abundance, the good news. It's hard to believe, though, that Pharaoh didn't at least think to himself, who is this guy? 
this former slave, now prisoner, telling me what to do. All we know is that at some point it made sense. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Imagine being Joseph. Close your eyes. He probably did. I imagine him closing his eyes and offering up a silent prayer, a deep and inward groan no words could ever express. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruah. Pharaoh uses it here in relation to God, but the narrator used it back in verse 8 to describe how Pharaoh felt when he woke up. In the morning, his mind, his ruah, his spirit was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Do you see how Pharaoh's spirit, his ruah, only comes to rest when he encounters someone filled with the spirit, the ruah of God? Jesus promises us that he will send the Holy Spirit, the holy ruah to us. But Jesus also says we must ask him to send him. Pharaoh then said to Joseph, we don't know how long it lasted between the question and the statement, since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Oh, to see the expression on Joseph's face. Did his eyes well up with tears? Did he exhale an audible gasp? Did he fall to his knees? in disbelief. We don't know. But it's at this moment that God declares, Joseph, you're ready. I put you in charge of your master's house. I put you in charge of the king's prison. Now I put you in charge of the king's palace. I told you that those dreams would come true. You read some stories and you can only imagine that they're written according to the timetable of a sovereign storyteller. The random twists and turns, the heart-wrenching rises and falls, the surprises that lurk round every corner. In a story like this, what else could you possibly conclude except that there must be a sovereign God standing behind it all. And even more, if a sovereign storyteller wrote Joseph's story, then isn't it possible that the same sovereign storyteller is writing yours? A sovereign God who is for you, not against you, always near, never far away, powerfully present, even if he feels entirely absent. Now imagine what would have happened if the cupbearer had not forgotten about Joseph, if it hadn't taken him so long to advocate for him, if he had pled his case with Pharaoh soon after he had been released so that Pharaoh set him free too. Well, two years later, Joseph would not have been in prison but he also would not have been asked to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, which means he would not have been put in charge of Pharaoh's palace, and the famine would not have been averted, as Pharaoh would have been left without an interpretation for his dreams, and thus no plan to prepare for the famine still to come. Sure, the nation of Egypt would have lived large for seven years, but it also would have been utterly destroyed another seven years later. The moral of this story, or much better, the gospel of this story, is that when God chooses to save, he saves many, not just a few, a nation in this case, and many surrounding communities, never just one individual. 
Joseph's salvation will lead to the salvation of the whole world. The J-curve extends as far as you can imagine. Joseph lived a long one. Jesus lived a long one. And you can live along a J-curve too, if you dare take the risk. Amen.